Afternoon, everybody. Why don't we get going? Uh, and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Yates Conwell. And in uh, Dr. Silverstein's absence, I'm really pleased to be introducing our speaker today. Uh, first, the information um, to help make sure this goes smoothly. Please remember uh, today, if you are on Zoom, um, that you should use the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Um, so we can keep the chat box open for uh, the interpreters and technical issues that come up. Um, we're going to be asking, we'll have time for, for questions after uh, the presentation. And for those of you, again, on Zoom, put those questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box. And those of you here in the room, please uh, definitely invite your questions and wait until we can get you a microphone. At that point, at the end of the session, uh, when uh, in order to then be able to have the folks on Zoom be able to hear your questions as well as the response. With regard to um, providing your feedback, which we truly value for the uh, for the Grand Rounds experience, uh, we will uh, be able to offer you continue to get education credits and an opportunity to provide that feedback. Uh, we'll do that in a couple of ways. At the end of the meeting, you'll see a, uh, a code. You can get to the evaluation form through uh, your uh, phone. And also um, in the next day or so, you will uh, receive an uh, email if you're registered for this event that'll invite you to go to a form to fill that out as well. Um, attendees who spend 45 minutes or more total in the Zoom session and who complete the evaluation will be uh, able to receive credit for the attendance or those of you who are here in the room. So the reason I'm so pleased uh, to make this introduction today is that I've had the uh, pleasure and the privilege of being a research mentor for our speaker today, Dr. Uh, Alexandre Payne Diaz, during his last two years here at the University of Rochester as a, a uh, National Research Service Award postdoctoral research fellow. Uh, this is through our Center for the Study and Prevention of Suicide. Uh, Alex, as uh, we know him, uh, completed um, medical school uh, in Brazil. He is uh, Brazilian. And um, after medical school there, he continued to develop his interests in mental health and psychiatry, doing his residency at the Institute of Psychiatry at Santa Catarina in Brazil, um, where he also continued to receive his PhD in medical sciences. He was in practice for a number of years uh, and then followed the research muse, doing a uh, postdoctoral fellowship for one year at Columbia, University under the guidance of Dr. Myrna Weissman, then uh, went back to Brazil a couple of years and then came back to the U.S. Uh, to do two additional years of postdoctoral research fellowship at uh, UT Houston. Um, it was during that time that uh, Alex learned more about as a clinician and as a researcher, an aspiring researcher, about the challenges of suicide and suicide prevention, and uh, then got in touch with us here because of the expertise that we're fortunate to have in that area through our Center for the Study and Prevention of Suicide applied to the postdoctoral fellowship that we have, two more years uh, of really outstanding work with us lead him to this point where he will be moving on actually to get rounded out as a, as a licensed psychiatrist through participation in the residency program at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Alex is a remarkable individual for the depth and breadth of his interests as a clinician uh, and as a scholar and his commitment to refining both of those over time. And uh, I have uh, really enjoyed seeing that process unfold over the last couple of years and know that he's going to make really tremendous contributions to our field uh, over time. The focus of uh, Alex's work uh, he will be talking about today was based 
on a uh, on a NARSAD grant, um, which he received, NARSAD Young Investigator Grant in 2020, and then worked with that through his time at Houston and then really hit the ground running with it here. This is very important work because it addresses the complex needs of really highly high risk individuals who, as he will explain to you, coming out of the hospital may be one of the highest risk groups that we, we face in our work for suicide. And so he has put together this potential intervention and learn so much about how to do this kind of work. And both of those things are gonna be important contributors to how we manage this really complicated problem. So with that background, please welcome Dr. Alex Payne Diaz. Thank you so much, Yates, for your kind introduction. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. So the title of this presentation is Transcranial Direct Current Stimulation a uh, non-invasive approach to decreasing suicide risk. These are my disclosures. As Yates mentioned, I have support from an ARSAD, a young investigator grant, and from NIMH for my training here at the Center for the Study and Prevention of Suicide in uh, Suicide Prevention. Sorry? Ah, okay. And now it's better? Good, okay, okay, good. So the idea for this presentation is to present very briefly uh, the epidemiology of suicidal behavior after hospital discharge to give some uh, context for this study, to give some information about the transcranial direct current stimulation, what from now on I'm gonna call as TDCS, and to present some preliminary results of a uh, feasibility study with home based CDCS after hospital discharge, we are conducting here at your MC, and some next steps, and I uh, hope have some time for questions. This report was released last year, and uh, it provides findings of all suicides between 2010 and 2020 across the UK countries. And one of the findings is that 14% of all suicide deaths by patients happen in the, uh, within three months after hospital discharge. And by patients here, they mean all individuals who were in contact with some mental health services in the year uh, previous to the suicide. So 14% of the total of suicides were uh, after hospital discharge and, and in the, uh, within three months after. This other study is, includes not only suicide, but also suicide, suicidal attempts. And the authors found that almost 75% of all suicidal behavior after a psychiatric hospitalization occur uh, within one year of the psychiatric hospitalization and more than 40%, 40% within three months. And specifically about the suicide rate, this study compare, uh, assessed the, the suicide rate within three months post discharge. And they found that it is about 80 times higher than the suicide rate for the general US population. And considering those patients who were admitted with suicide ideation and or behavior, the suicide rate within three months post discharge is 150 times higher than for the, the general population. 
in addition to to that, the, the transition between the the emergency service in the, the hospital uh, uh, inpatient treatment and outpatient services is characterized by a lack of adherence for treatment. As up to 50% of the patients, they refuse treatment or they drop out very fast. And up to 60%, they do not engage in more than one week of treatment. So this is a very uh, critical moment and, and we need to investigate and uh, test interventions that are effective, of course, and also that facilitate the adherence by these patients. And some of these interventions uh, are those that can be administered remotely or at home. Moving uh, a little the topic about TDCS, TDCS is a non-invasive brain stimulation uh, together with transcranial magnetic stimulation and electroconvulsive therapy. It consists on electrodes there I, I, they are put on the scalp of the patient and it delivers a, a very weak electric current. Let me see if we can, let me see if I can move this here to show you here. Uh, this is a, a, a montage, very conventional montage. And by montage, I mean the place where we we, the, the electrodes are localized on the skull. The, one of the most conventional montages is the bipolar, where we have two electrodes. And for our study in particular, the montage is bipolar bilateral over the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And the mechanism of action is not well understood, but the, the anodal stimulation is able to increase the excitability of the cortex, increase the cortical excitability, and the, the, and the cathode decrease this cortical excitability. And despite the electric current is not strong enough to depolarize the, the membrane of the neuron, it seems that the cortical excitability of thousands of neurons are able to modulate brain circuits in uh, that probably underline the, the clinical effects of this intervention. As you can see here, for these two examples of uh, TDCS modulating the default mode network. There are many studies, uh, clinical trials investigating the TDCS as a potential intervention especially for neurological and psychiatric conditions. Here are some examples, percurrent pain, Alzheimer's disease, depression. And we can see when we put TDCS in randomized control trial on the PubMed, you see the increasing interest on this uh, intervention for different medical conditions over the last 20 years. Specifically about depression, these two meta-analyses, they, uh, they, they found that the active TDCS is superior to sham TDCS in decreasing suicide uh, depressive symptoms. And what I say when I say active TDCS is uh, the, the configuration with the device that delivers the electric current that is associated with therapeutic effects. And by sham TDCS is like the placebo for the intervention. So it also delivers an electric current, but not the same pattern. And comparing active and, and sham TDCS, several studies for depression and this true meta-analysis reinforce these findings that TDCS is uh, superior to sham in decreasing uh, depressive symptoms and also with a higher uh, percentage of response and remission. With the additional advantage that it can be portable, so it can be administered at home, it's very straightforward to use. 
and with minimal adverse effect, um, effects. But one question that we have is if TDCS is effective in reducing suicidal ideation. We don't have enough information in the literature to answer this question. Only one study was published last year that also uh, explored the suicide ideation in a randomized control trial for depression with suicide ideation. So we, we, we don't have enough information for, for answering this question. So one way to have some kind of suggestion that this can be uh, maybe a potential intervention for decreasing suicide ideation is through this type of study and uh, that is a, a different type of meta-analysis. It called, uh, called individual patient data meta-analysis. In this type of meta-analysis, we ask for the, the researchers that conducted randomized control trials with the DCS for depression, we ask for the, the data for each subject. Whether then uh, 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 we, we don't use the, the total scores of the depression scale, this is done through um, the more common meta-analysis. For this one, we, we ask for each data for the, the subject. In this way, we can go to the depressing scale and look for the specific items that we are interested to, to analyze. For instance, here, for the Madras scale, a depression scale that are very common in randomized control trials for interventions um, for depression, we have uh, we, we are interested on the item 10 of the scale that measures suicide ideation. And here I have the, 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 this item with the description of the scores. It varies from zero to six, uh, all of them cover suicide ideation. And the item six, the, 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 the score six, it also have some information about behavior, but most of them about suicidal ideation. And so we have done that. And this, some very preliminary analysis, we are still uh, conducting more analysis with this data. We, I, I can, uh, we can see here, one is related to the active TDCS and zero, the sham. The, the placebo TDCS. And we can see that in both groups, there was a decrease in the suicide ideation scores of the mothers. Uh, and the negative indicates a decrease it, it, uh, because the, the delta is the endpoint minus the baseline. So here for both groups, the baseline was higher than the endpoint. And we can see that for active TDCS, the, the decrease was, uh, was more increased than the, the sham TDCS. And this difference was statistically significant. This doesn't answer, it's not like a definitive answer, but it suggests at least that uh, it's worth to keep going and keep investigating this um, for suicide ideation. And one important thing I want to show here is the, this is the distribution in this graph about the, the answers for the suicide ideation item. And you can see here that most of them are zero, one, or two. And this is very common for uh, clinical trials for depression. Because they the it is they used to exclude those patients with high level high higher levels of suicide ideation at the baseline, and so this this population population with high risk for suicide with higher levels of suicide ideation they are, are used not so well represented in these clinical trials. This is one more reasons that we need to to 
to study and see what can be uh, feasible and effective for um, this population. We have also the results for the other, uh, other measures, other depression scales as Hamilton, but it seems that the MADRAS is the, mo the, the most valid one to measure suicide ideation. The other question is, is home-based DCS feasible after uh, hospital discharge? So we know that home-based DCS is feasible for other conditions. This study published in 22, they uh, assessed more than 6,000 home-based DCS sessions. And their conclusion is that, yes, home-based DCS is feasible, is safe. However, we are interested on a different population, a, a population that I, I, as I mentioned, they are not well represented in clinical studies. Uh, also because they, they have a right, high risk for suicidal behavior. And, and this is a moment for them uh, that gives a lot of challenges to see if this is intervention that we we can do uh, at home because they are uh, after the hospitalization even for short term hospitalizations they are also they have to get back to their routine they have their commitments with work and school and with their relationships so we don't know how would be there possible for them to receive this treatment at home, especially because uh, we supervise the sessions. So we need to find a time uh, when it's good for the, the patient and also uh, possible for the supervisor. So we don't have this question if it is feasible for this specific population that are very in need for uh, effective interventions after a hospitalization. And also, because uh, sometimes this population, they have um, still very disabling symptoms. We know that uh, the objective of the hospitalization, the inpatient care, is not necessarily the remission of the, the symptoms. Uh, but So they still have a lot of symptoms, and this can be an additional challenge to uh, see if they are, uh, they can do this treatment at home. So this, uh, we registered this, um, this study at clinicaltrials.gov and we discussed it here for a lot of time with my mentors and we just decide the, the, the best protocol, the, the best safety approach for the, the subjects. And here we have the, the primary outcome for this study, which is feasibility. And what we, we, we consider feasibility, if at least 70% of the subjects complete at least five of recommended 10 RS TDCI sessions, RS is remotely supervised TDCI sessions. And why 70%? Uh, based on one, on one study that show a dropout rate of 25% for TDCS, home-based TDCS for bipolar depression. Why five recommended sessions based on studies that show that for some patients, there is some very fast improvement uh, during the first week of the intervention. This, the, this, the second study here, they also, uh, uh, showed an improvement in depressive symptoms after five days of stimulation, despite their protocols a little different than, than ours. For them, they use it twice a day during 20 minutes each session. And our protocol is 30, 30 minutes once a day. So this is our feasibility criteria. And we have also uh, secondary outcome measures, clinical measures, uh, suicide ideation, behavior, depressive symptoms, uh, side effects, and also the acceptability of the intervention that I'm gonna show um, soon. 
our inclusion on criteria, I, I'm not go uh, over each one, but one of the inclusion criteria is uh, history of suicidal ideation and our suicidal behavior at the time of admission. And this is the, the population which the suicide rate is 150 times higher than for the general population. And among the exclusion criteria, some that are related to the fact that we are delivering an electric current. Um, so we exclude those with uh, history of epilepsy, any kind of pacemaker, et cetera. This is the study flow chart. And here I, I want to, to thank our study coordinator, Joshua Mike Elliott, uh, Josh, who is doing a wonderful work and so fun to work with in this study. We are learning a lot together. So we started the study with a pre-screening to find potential um, eligible patients. And then the in-person screening for eligibility. If the patient is eligible and accept to participate and sign the informed consent, we do the baseline assessment in person. And the baseline assessment includes um, uh, a test with the device. If they can, the, the, the patient has the opportunity to feel the, the electric current and it, we rate the tolerability, the, the, the pain, if, the, if there is any pain. And uh, so we apply the questionnaires and then subject is randomized to sham or active TDCS. We track the, the date of discharge. And once patients discharge, we send the device. We, we counted the, 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 the subject just to check if the address is the same. Sometimes things happen after the hospitalization and they may not go to the, to the address that we have. So we make sure that they can receive the, the device and we send the device in a, in a box with a label, a prepaid label to return it back. So once the device arrives, I contact the, the subject to schedule the first TDCS session. And so we have 10, uh, 10 uh, TDCS sessions every day, weekdays. We skip Saturday and Sundays. After the 10 TDCS sessions, we start the follow-ups. Day 14, day 30, and day 60 uh, follow-up. Day, day 14, 14 days from the first TDCS session, Day 30, 30 days from the first, and 60, the same thing. And we have some window, like 14 plus 7 days, 30 plus 10 days, and 60 plus 10 days. So considering the time until the device arrives at the, at the subject's house, it, it covers about two to three months after hospital charge. This is the device, and here an example of, uh, let's see, here an example of a device that is set uh, a sham with the configuration that we use in our protocol, two milliamperes intensity, duration 30 minutes, hemp duration 30 seconds, because it doesn't start from zero to two milliamperes, so there is a hemp up and hemp down of 30 seconds. And when we set up the, the configuration, we also get codes to unlock the device. So the device turns on and works only with the code. So before the, before the session, I uh, guide the, the, the subject, especially in the first or second session from the third on they they set up everything very easily uh, but I, I guide them and we turn on the the device and it it tells the device shows in the screen if the contact is good moderate or poor and uh, I give the code and 
the simulation session starts for 30 minutes. This is a representation, it's not a real, from our study, um, a representation of a remotely supervised session. Uh, we set up the meeting uh, by Zoom. So the, this, this, this code has the, uh, also for safety, so they are not able to, for any reason, um, to do more than one sessions or, or with another kind of duration or intensity. And also to make sure that every subject is receiving the same protocol. This time, the study time points and, and measures. So we have measures in person, as I mentioned, the time of the enrollment. Uh, so clinical uh, measures and the remote, we, we have the, the, for each remote supervision, each, each uh, remotely encounter, after the TTCS sessions and after the follow-ups, we assess the, we use the CSSRS, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale to assess suicide ideation or behavior. And so we have this assessment at each encounter and, and, out, and also at baseline. And in addition to the, after the end of the CSSRS, we have these two questions. Uh, active, we ask the, the subject, is they have any active ideation with planning intent current? We ask if they have any suicidal thoughts, ideation at that moment. And if yes, uh, if any plan or intent. And this, are not, this other question is for ourselves, if, if we are concerned for some reason about the patient. If either of them are answered as yes, we have a plan to contact one of the licensed clinicians of our study to contact the, the subject and do the, the proper assessment and management. This hasn't happened uh, so far with our study. And we have, we have 70 TDCS sessions and 15 follow-ups, so 85 encounters. After the session 10, uh, I applied the acceptability questionnaire and the blinding assessment when I ask the patient, uh, the subject, what intervention they, they think they, they got, if either active or sham. If the answer don't know, we have another question. Please give us your best guess to assess the blinding of the intervention. Let me turn on this pointer here. This is the consort flow diagram uh, for the study. We assess it for eligibility 33 uh, patients so far, and this is excluded 24 and enrolled nine. This is a, a pace that is lower than we, we wanted, but I think it's the, the best one for a feasibility study with, uh, uh, that we, we need to take a lot of uh, care of, of the, the, the assessments and, and the patients. So despite it's lower than we, we expected, I think it's the best pace for this feasibility study and also allows us to learn a lot of things as it's going. And as there is no other studies with on base CDCS for this special population, this is the opportunity that we learn, like doing it. So it's good that we have this, uh, this space. This is a uh, very interesting information. Also some, the days in, on average, the mean days between important uh, moments of the study. So for instance, between the baseline and the hospital discharge, we have, on average, one day. And from the hospital discharge to the first CDC session, about eight to nine days. So we start the study, the first CDC session, 
almost uh, just after the first week after hospital discharge. So we have wanted with the, the, the subject very soon the, the, after the hospitalization. And also tells a lot about the, all the help that we have to conduct this study here at URMC. Um, uh, we, we receive a lot of support from the, the healthcare professionals in the hospital to, to conduct this study here. Some socio-demographic and also one clinical information about this sample. The mean age is 22 years old, younger than the mean age of those patients that were approached. Most of them female, all single, most white, non-Hispanic, no most of them current employed and or uh, still in school. All of them were or studying or in school. And two thirds with uh, lifetime suicidal behavior. This is the overall. So here we have nine enrolled. These are not the subjects ID, just numbers to represent each one. Only one did not start, even start the sessions and only one started and did not complete the sessions. All others that started the study, they uh, complete not only the five uh, sessions for our feasibility criteria, according to our feasibility criteria, but completed the, the 10 recommended sessions. Five of them completed all follow-ups and one completed the, the TDCS session and the, the 10, and the day 14 follow-up is already scheduled. And for this, uh, this uh, last subject here, the, the session nine and 10 is already scheduled. So probably we will have uh, seven with uh, that completed all TDCS session. So far, 70 remotely supervised, and 78% of feasibility. This very uh, uh, representation or, or the, 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 the clinical, the trajectory of the, some clinical measures for this very like few subjects and we don't know sham and active. So just to show some, some the trajectory of their, their these clinical measures. For suicidal ideation severity, here baseline, day 14, day 30, and day 60, from zero to, to five, five the highest um, severity. Suicide ideation intensity, intensity, it, it, it is scored from zero to 25, and based on the frequency, duration, controllability, deterrence, and reasons for ideation, higher scores, higher intensity. The, for depression, so one information here, I think it's important to point is that uh, for Madras depression scale, the one of the ways to, to categorize the it clinically is considering between seven and, and 19 as mild, 20 to 34 as moderate. And you can see here from these five uh, subjects, four of them were in uh, moderate depression severity. So uh, most of them at baseline, they uh, had a moderate uh, severity of depression. Most of them with a lifetime um, a history of lifetime suicidal behavior um, after just after the hospital discharge. So a very specific population that it's not uh, very well represented in other clinical trials. And I have a, an interesting ruminative uh, symptoms as it is a risk factor for, for um, suicide ideation and maybe a potential target to intervene. Here, the, this, the score of this scale varies from 22 to 88, 
higher scores, higher rumination. And this, the acceptability questionnaire for six subjects that completed all 10 sessions. And uh, let's discuss some of these findings here. I highlighted uh, those that I, I, I thought more, more informative. We can see here that all of them, I put in percentage because I think it's easier to interpret. Uh, all of them answers that they could find a convenient time to do the simulation sessions and that the sessions did not interfere with their everyday life which was one of our concerns about if they would find a time to do the sessions in, in that moment of their lives. When you we ask about if the treatment uh, benefited them, most of them were neutral, but none of them disagree or strongly disagree. So maybe it can tell about some uh, uh, side effects or it, maybe they, they didn't feel any worse uh, uh, clinically with the intervention, but most of them were, were neutral. And yeah, I, I discussed that for instance, for, for also feasibility criteria, it was five sessions of the DCS because some studies show some improvement in depressive symptoms with five sessions, but the, the rule and what the, what they said I've shown is that we need more sessions for the therapeutic effect of the uh, TDCS, at least for depression, we don't know for suicidal ideation. So we have this question if they would have done more than the sessions that, more than 10 sessions. And only one just agreed that uh, wouldn't consider this. Lessons learned so far, uh, so their uh, young population, at, at least in our in our sample. So one question is like maybe this is more um, there's more acceptance from younger individuals, considering that those who are approached they they are in age that is very representative of what we we have in, in treatment in the hospital, but. The, those who, who enrolled was very uh, much younger. 78% uh, of them completed five or more TDCS sessions. And I uh, maybe the same percentage will complete the 10 sessions. From those who started, 89% completed the, the five or more. To these sessions, and again, they maybe they will complete all ten. Eighty-three percent, or five of six, probably would consider more sessions. All indicated that the sessions did not interfere with their routine, which is uh, for us was one of the big challenges for this um, intervention being feasible. And all indicated that the sessions did not, uh, oh, sorry. And there was no adverse events related to the intervention so, so far. For the next steps, uh, complete the, the data collection for this feasibility study and conduct some, some comparisons between active and shame, the clinical and outcomes and also related to safety. And more, of course, in the future, maybe uh, conducting a, a larger, larger clinical trial. But for for this, there are many questions before uh, we start to think about this. Uh, one of them is how uh, would we measure suicide ideation, given its very uh, fluctuating nature of suicide ideation? So how? Would be, which would be the, the best way to, to, to determine this, this outcome. Combining with other approaches, uh, so for depression, it takes weeks to see the, the difference between 
Active and Shen. And so there, there is a, a weeks that without any kind of maybe benefit for those who would be benefited by the intervention. But at the same time, we have the opportunity to be in contact with these patients very soon after hospital discharge. And we know that one of the interventions that for suicide prevention that are uh, effective is uh, in addition to the safety planning at the, at the hospital, a brief contact after, after discharge, a brief follow-up. And in, with this intervention, we have this contact with this, the, the patient every, every weekday at least. So should we, I don't know, combine with other approaches or take advantage of this opportunity to, to promote more uh, connection and, and other approaches to, to increase the, uh, our efforts in suicide prevention for this population. Number of sessions and clinical characteristics of the, the subjects uh, and the montage, the placement of the electrodes. Let me discuss this more with this study here. These are two studies with home-based DCS for depression. One of them was negative and this other positive, despite this one is still in preprint. So it's not peer review yet. And difference between them, this first one, they accept patients with up to three failed uh, antidepressive trials, that is with treatment resistant depression. And this other, no, just one failed antidepressant trials. That is, they did not accept patients with treatment resistant depression. And the second one with uh, more extended um, sessions. And, and so maybe this intervention is for uh, first, should be we, we should deliver more uh, more, uh, more sessions and during more time to find this um, therapeutic effect, and maybe it is more appropriate for patients uh, with no treatment resistant depression. I'm talking here about depression. Despite for this one, they saw some difference between active and shin at uh, week four, and specifically about the montage, uh, as, as I mentioned, we, we use it for this study, a very conventional montage, the, the bipolar one with two electrodes. And the, this kind of montage, the cortical stability is very diffuse. And researchers are starting to, to try other types of montage that give more focality for the regions of interest. Uh, for example, this one with a uh, multi-channel, this is also for home-based DCS, for depression, for older adults. This is a feasibility. This, uh, this is the results for the feasibility. And they have the results for the, in a preprint. But that was published so far is the feasibility with five patients. And with this multi-channel, they uh, use comp computational approaches to to see where would be the best focality. And so we can maybe uh, use these simulations to target specific brain circuits of interest. For instance, uh, if you want to target rumination or anhedonia, which are risk factors for, for suicide, and or based on studies with neuroimaging with, for suicide ideation, try to determine which would be the best brain circuit to, to modulate. So to finalize, uh, I need to, to thank my mentors, Dr. Yates Conwell and Dr. Antonio Pisani, and uh, my coworkers here. Uh, I, I have the privilege to be part of a team who is working other studies for suicide prevention, the ASIP and war in science. And as part of my training, I have been learning a lot with all of them through these years. Again, uh, NARSAD and MIMH and the Center for the Study and Prevention of Suicide, the university, and especially the patients who, uh, who committed with this study in such a 
uh, special moment and critical moment for them. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we do have time for some uh, questions. And uh, let's see, anybody that has one, please put your hand up and we'll get you a microphone. There's a couple on uh, online here. Uh, Alex, one question from, uh, from Dr. Romani is, how is this different from TMS? Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes, TMS is more as a transcranial magnetic stimulation that you need to go to an institution to receive this treatment. Uh, it's not portable and it's much stronger. Uh, I, I think I mentioned that the DCS is not, the stimulation is not able to depolarize the individual uh, neurons. It's only increased the cortical excitability and TMS does this, it's much stronger. And, uh, but, the, the difference is that one is more cortical, uh, the electric current delivers in the, on the scalp of the individual, and the other uses uh, magnetic stimulation, and only TDCS is portable and can be administered at home. Um, one thing it's worth pointing out, I think, is that this kind of stuff, this kind of work on an inpatient unit is really hard to do, and uh, we really need to acknowledge the efforts of the staff on the unit, uh, the treatment teams and, and your skill in pulling those stakeholders together to make this kind of thing work. That obviously given a enormous increased risk for suicide following discharge, working with inpatient services to find the evidence for what's gonna work to mitigate that risk is uh, is really key. So a, a real shout out to all the folks on the inpatient side that were here to work with that. Uh, is there a question here? Thank you so much for that presentation, Alex. My question is very practical in nature, and I think you might have discussed it a little bit on the inclusion criteria or your demographic slide. And it is like, what patient do you think would be ideal presenting to the ED? What patient do you think would be ideal for this kind of home-based TDCS treatment? That will really help clinicians, I think. Mm -hmm. hmm. Good question. Thank you, LNG. Um, yeah, I think patients who have some uh, maybe family support at home, I think this is important. Um, as we are dealing with, with, with a device and despite the technology is very simple, they uh, have some, they manage this kind of device more easily. Despite again, it's very, um, very easy to, to learn it. And also this is another reason that a, person at home would be also useful. And yeah, Thanks. I think most- What about their suicidal presentation? Oh, okay, yeah. So at suicide, uh, for, those, for, for this inclusion criteria, for instance, we excluded those that at that moment of uh, uh, assessment, they had any level of suicide ideation. They could have in the previous week, but at that moment, exactly with no suicide ideation. I still think we have this discussion and I still think that uh, we, need to, we need to, for this type of study, enroll for the study or, of, or for the treatment, those at that, that point of enrollment, they don't have any level of suicide ideation. I, I, I should believe this, that there is some discussion and, and I, I understand the point of others. Uh, despite we, we, again, we included those with high levels of suicide ideation considering the past week, but not at that moment. At that moment, I don't think that it, it's the time to, 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 um, to include this patient spe specifically, because we don't, we should don't know if uh, the therapeutic effects or uh, 
we have to to think that it may might like uh, adverse events even like I don't know increase in society we, we we don't know so I think I don't I don't feel comfortable to enroll patients with suicide issue at the moment of enrollment. Uh, Alex, there are two related questions here uh, from the remote audience relating to the sham condition. One uh, asks, can you speak to the pros and cons of, of the sham condition? Is it convincing to subjects? And how do you talk with subjects about it at the end of the study? The other is asking, how effective is the active sham blinding? Active sham uh, blinding? For our study, we don't know. But based on other studies, is uh, is very effective. And uh, the first question is, is uh, essentially uh, the, the same. Uh, what are the pros and cons of, of this? If it's very effective, that, that's terrific. Mm -hmm. but the other part of that question, interestingly, I think was uh, uh, also relates to acceptability and and the future use of this intervention. That is, how do you talk to in the research context, how do you talk to the patients afterwards about whether they had a sham or the real treatment? Yeah, when I ask these questions, I I, I don't know yet, and we didn't uh, break the, the blinding. But so far, when I asked these questions, I think most of them answered, I don't know at first. And, and when I ask, I, I tell them, look, I also don't know which treatment you received, if active or sham. Uh, but if I'm not wrong, all uh, almost all of them answered, uh, I don't know. And then the best guess, like, is very, very random. I think it's, and one thing about sham, I think it's worth to discuss, is that it is very powerful as well. For all non-invasive brain stimulations, the, the, the sham is, is, it's like a, more powerful than we see for medications, for instance. And so this is also very challenging to start to see the difference between active and shen, because as both of them, we see some kind of uh, clinical effect to really identify when one separate from the other, it takes, uh, it takes time. But yeah, it's... Uh, okay. Uh if there are no other questions from the audience, there is one. Oh, sorry. And what about the ad? Any any applications yet for you know like ad adolescents like 16, 17, 18 years old? Mm -hmm. Is there any any, <laughs> <laughs> any any studies or anything that is opening up for them? I don't know, but I will look for and I I let you know, Sigmund. Sigmund is a friend from Houston, very good soccer player. <laughs> I let you know, I, I, I look forward. Okay, I think we're out of time and we'll stop at that point. Thanks again. Thank you. Stop.